I'm Saloni Doshi, the founder and director of Space 118. For those who don't know, Space 118 has been an artist studio and residency space for the past 10 years, where we've supported artists from 400 artists from all over the world. Our vision has been to nurture the interdisciplinary impetus of the global art practitioners to creative workshops and residencies for experimentation in the visual arts. Standing on the values of dialogue, openness, experience, and collaboration, we have now expanded our role from being a residency space into an independent grants making organization. Today, I welcome you to our talk series on making. It's the fourth edition, where we invite artists and curators to take us through their art making and exhibition making practices. At a time like this, we at Space 118 feel that it is more crucial to bring audiences to a behind the scenes perspective into how to make an exhibition. And in this case, as with our speaker today, on how to make a Biennale scale summit. Whether it is the years of rigor that finally brings an idea to fruition from process to materiality or the many hands of institutions, patro uh, patrons and donors who lend invaluable support along the way. Joining us today is a curator with a path breaking approach. The American born Princeton educated Diana Campbell Bethancourt has re-envisioned re modern and contemporary art institutions, fostering dynamic and unique collaborations with international museums, foundations, governments, collectors, curators, writers, and artists. Her commitment to realizing her vision of an expansive transnational art world, inclusive of underrepresented regions and artists, has produced concrete and highly visible new initiatives over six continents that are rewriting art history today. She has successfully navigated financial, political, geographical, climatic, language, institutional, and ideological challenges, leading multiple concurrent teams to create successful exhibitions and build bridges while fostering synergies between traditional and new media. Her strategic expertise includes large scale exhibitions and program planning. Through all of this, magnifying and concretizing ideas from concept through execution. She has successfully partnered with global institutions to develop expanded awareness of underrepresented artists and practices with her innovative educational and research programs, specifically those with their heart in Bangladesh. Fluent in Spanish, Portuguese, and with an early career in finance at JP Morgan and in the arts in Sotheby's at the Neu and at the Neu Gallery in New York. And as an independent curator, Diana followed her partner from New York to Hyderabad, which is in India in 2010 when she was in her mid twenties. She was hired by a patron in Hyderabad to develop a foundation called Creative India Foundation to support Indian sculptors in the internet, to support Indian sculptors in international residencies, exhibitions, and production grants ahead of opening a sculpture park in Hyderabad. But this pro project never materialized. And however, it brought Diana to India and all of us. And then she curatorially led the launch of Artsy, which is a contemporary art program of Vijay and Sunita Churaria's public art initiative in their mall in Chennai. And she still chairs on the board of the Mumbai Art Room here in Mumbai, uh, which she helped transition into a curatorial lab for emerging curators. In 2013, she began working for the Samdani Art Foundation and together with its patrons and founders, Rajiv and Nadia Samdani, developed the Dhaka Art Summit and the Samdani Art Foundation as key institutions supporting knowledge and artistic production about Bangladesh and South Asia and making it accessible for local and international audiences. From 2016 to 18, concurrent to her work in Bangladesh, Diana was the founding artistic director of Belia's Artist Projects, which is in the Philippines. It's a not-for-profit residency and has an exhibitions program. And she has also been the curator of the Freeze Projects in London in 2018 and 19 commissioning performances, films, 
and time-based works. As an art patron myself, I have often believed that the landmark victory of putting together a great show is to receive it with a great audience. The art newspaper named Dhaka Art Summit in 2018 as the highest daily visited exhibition in the world with over 35,000 visitors per day. And its 2020 edition, which concluded, I think, in the beginning of this year, welcome 4,77,153 visitors over nine days. So welcome, Diana. Look forward to your insightful talk. I would also like to introduce Falguni Guliani, who's our Space 118 Contemporaries art writer in residence and the moderator for today. And she will be taking over from Diana for the Q&A. Over to you, Diana. Excellent. Thank you so much, Saloni, for inviting me to um, present as part of your platform. Um, India is somewhere that is very close to my heart, um, somewhere I miss every day. Um, I lived there from 2010 till 2016, and it really informs the way I see the world. And um, it's a place where, as a very young person, I was so lucky to have so many generous people um, believing in my ideas and helping me realize them. Um, I, you know, dreams and ideas that I, I never had when I lived in New York. So I'll talk a bit about the kind of process of um, how these moments that seem unconnected came together to build um, the Dhaka Art Summit and Samdani Art Foundation that are so visible today. Um, but maybe before I get there, um, I was on another Zoom call this week um, that the Marg Foundation organized with Glenn Lowry and Sahar Shah. And Glenn said something really interesting that stuck with me this week about what the role of a cultural institution is today. Um, and I'll kind of quote him a bit. I'm sure I'm misquoting, but it appears from my notes that our role as a cultural institution is to think about how the present impacts our understanding of the past. Our role is to make the past different because of what we know today and to re-articulate relationships because the present has given us new information and new ideas to contend with and to look at how that might re um, inform our thinking of the immediate past. Um, and I think that that is really important. Like we're in a moment right now of such large social change and um, things that we took for granted as fixed might change with a different lens. And I think that's something that we've really been working on. Um, on building in Dhaka, I guess, since the Samnani started this platform in 2012 and since I came into it in 2013. Um, so I will start my slides, um, share my screen. Um, and I apologize for the sniffling, the weather is changing here, so I'm a bit allergic to the pollen, but just bear with me. Great. So um, whenever I do something, um, not really in a strategic way, but it's, it's a thought that we're building towards tomorrow. Um, the world is our field of practice, right? It's, it's a place where we're constantly practicing. So we can think of practice from a sports perspective, right? If you're on a team, you have to practice together. If you're an artist, you're in your, you have a studio practice. Um, if you're a dancer, you, have, you, have a, um, you are practicing. But I think it's the same thing as a curator and institution builder, that each project you're working on is practiced towards something that you don't know yet. Um, and Elizabeth Pavanelli, um, who's a thinker I respect very much and who was part of the last Dhaka Art Summit, um, has a beautiful statement that if your thoughts weren't practiced, then it was never really a thought or a practice. So how do you put your ethics and your beliefs uh, into practice with the various platforms that you have access to? And the other idea that imagination is a muscle that we need to exercise. How can you imagine the kind of world you want to live in, or in our case, the kind of art world that we want to operate in? Um, and one of the books I've been reading, um, which is a fascinating book by the um, Bangladeshi economist, Mohammed Yunus, is talking about the prob one of the problems with the world today, especially with the youth who are so unempowered. They, they, the, this book was written, it's, it's called The Three Zeros, and it's about eradicating poverty, um, inequality and carbon emissions it was written in 2017. He talks about the huge unemployment rate for young people at that time, which of course is exacerbated now, but the problem of people looking to get a job and not the idea of building um, building new jobs or building new careers that um, react to the time of now. So I think that this was something very interesting that we did with the Dhaka Art Summit and the Samdani Art Foundation. We didn't take an existing platform from somewhere else. We really built something from the ground up. We imagined what we wanted to see and we built it. So when it comes to looking at the diversity that you find um, 
in our teams or in our platforms in a way it was easier for us to build this from the ground up than to adapt to kind of existing um elitist structures i'll get more to that in a bit so looking about practice um if my slides move um i actually come from a dance background so my whole life i brought it or you know till i was 18 i really wanted to be a ballerina so my whole life was spent around ballet if my parents went on vacation, I would get very upset because my training would be set off because I wasn't in the studio every day. And it was really an obsession. And what I love about ballet is that it's this idea of trying to reach the impossible. Like there's something physically impossible, but if you really work hard enough, you can get there, right? So you can stand on your toes. You can do 32 turns like consecutively. But to be a really good dancer is when the technique disappears into your body and you can start being an artist, but you need the technical training to get there. So while my dreams of being a ballerina weren't realized, what was incredible is the understanding of how to work with space and bodies, movements and time. Um, and so in the last DACA Art Summit, I was so moved to be able to work with William Forsyth, who is the arguably the most important living choreographer who I couldn't work, I probably and wasn't that good enough, but like wouldn't have been able to work with as a ballerina, but was able to work with in a contemporary art context. And I was only able to do that because of the understanding I have of that field, the expanded field of choreography. So this image on the right um, is an image um, of a work called Fact of Matter that um, is one of Bill's, I guess, most popular works. He creates um, a body of work that are called choreographic objects. So they're in sculptures and installations that make you acutely aware of how your body functions. So here, what you're supposed to do is levitate across these rings and move across the room without touching the ground. As you do that, because you're destabilized from your body, you start to realize how your heart beats, the coordination or lack of coordination between your arms and legs, all these kind of motor functions that disappear when life is normal. If you're just walking and things work, you don't start thinking about these internal um, properties of your body and how it works. Um, and I think that's also very interesting. Um, with Bill Forsyth also talks about um, failure or the potential for failure to be very important because if something's so easy, you can do it in your sleep and you're not actively thinking about it. Um, so bringing the body into the exhibition and the body into work is something that would tie most of my projects or the way I see space. Um, so this is another work by William Forsyth that was in the last DACA Art Summit. And um, it's a very political work, subtly political, but it's called um, A Volume beneath which it is, it is not possible for certain classes of action to arise. So for example, let's say if um, there are police barricades, you can't go in a certain location. There might be a different way to get there. You have to re-navigate how you go through that space. Um, so in this work, the volume is basically some drywall that, um, that creates this kind of floating cube structure where you actually can't walk through the space. So you have to find new ways to get through it. In this case, you can roll, you can crawl. Um, there are different ways to navigate through the space. Your body has to find those solutions. So it's not just taking ways of movement for granted, it's inventing new ways to move. And this um, kind of um, work, so this was a pairing I was very happy with in the last DACA Art Summit. So it was a video work by Hadra Wahid called The Spiral, which is looking at the form of the spiral and various existential meanings of that. Um, and um, Bill's work, uh, A Volume, which is a short version of it. So people would roll or spiral through the space and enter this other world. Um, so yeah, playing with how people move and what moves people is something that moves me as a curator. And that comes from that dance background that I never thought would be useful um, or applied to a contemporary art context. Um, because of my background as a dancer, I know how to work with dancers. So sometimes um, curators don't understand, you know, working with live, or unless you have experience working in the performing arts, commissioning performance-based work is extremely complicated and also extremely expensive because you need to, it's not just about the run of the exhibition, it's renting rehearsal space. It's, um, you know, the, the medium is the body. You have to make sure people are well fed, that they're slept, that they sleep, that they're in good conditions. Like, you know, you're, you're taking care of people and um, their relationships and the relationships of the bodies to each other, the time they spend together. Um, it's, it's a very different way of working. And one of the projects I really enjoyed working on the most was um, 
a, a commission for freeze, uh, the Freeze Artist Award in 2018, where we commissioned a new piece of choreography um, by the Polish emerging artist, Alex Baczynski Jenkins. And the piece was called Holding Horizon. And it was about a 90 minute piece of choreography where dancers um, were querying the idea of the box step. So the box step is one of the most um, basic structures of social dance, but by, by the way they were playing with it, it suddenly became circular. It kind of whirled out of, um, it, it whirled out of its structure um, while being very much based in that structure. Um, but the point is that, yeah, I like working, working in these performative ways is also possible in platforms like the summit, which is only nine days long, which isn't possible in kind of three month long biennials, or it, it would not be, you know, to kind of have, uh, you know, the dancers wouldn't be able to stick around for that period of time. So also when we think about time uh, in the DACA context, it's really about how can we get as many people to actively participate um, and move uh, in that time. So that people ask a lot, why only nine days? That's part of it. Um, this um, piece later went to tour to the Venice Biennial. Um, the artist has recently been shortlisted for the Future Generation Art Prize. He later had a solo show at the Kunsthalle Basel, and this piece was part of it. So I really love being part of emerging artists' journeys early on, and kind of the way that um, patrons in India and Bangladesh gave me a chance at a very young age. It's also something that to me is very important is to work with young people at moments of their career when that um, trust and those resources can create a big leap in their um, future potential with other people. Um, so this was another performance that was really um, quite a, a pleasure to work on with a Thai artist named Korakrit Adaronchai and, and his collaborator Alex, Alex Gorvik. Um, and so this piece was called Together. And um, what was really fun to do in the summit was at seven o'clock, the first two days of the summit, the lights went off and the exhibition became a stage. Um, and it became a stage for a performance. So you can, tra you can change worlds um, very easily by just kind of changing the staging of things. So I also love that term staging exhibitions. Um, and so um, Korakrit uh, has a, a pretty big international career, but he hasn't done um, a performance like this in Asia before. And he was collaborating with Bangladeshi performers um, and also looking at the story of Inaga and rivers. And so the way that regions are usually classified, Southeast Asia will be in one group, South Asia will be in another group, but there are many rivers and stories connecting the two. So I find Bangladesh, and I'll talk about this later in the presentation, but as this beautiful crossroads between South and Southeast Asia. And Southeast Asia is a Cold War, a Cold War hangover term. And if we look at what links South Asia, a lot of it is British colonial history. So if we remove those, actually, they're far more meshed than one would think. And um, so we try to play with those. Um, meetings of points and contexts. And um, so we were very lucky. The summit finished on February 15th, a meeting, and we had almost 500,000 people in nine days. Um, had this been a week later, I don't think that would have been possible. Um, but, you know, working with crowds and large groups of people also became like a medium that inspired a lot of the artists that we worked with. Um, okay, so other things. People often ask, like, you're American, how can you understand these kind of complex um, colonial histories? But the thing is, my Americanness is not so clear. Um, my mother and my um, my mother's side of the family comes from a tiny island called Guam, which is one of the last seventeen colonies left in the world. So while India is independent, my homeland is not. It's occupied by the U.S. military. So if you look at where it is, it's three hours from Japan. It's um, three hours from Manila. It's nowhere near the continental United States. Um, but it's a very strategic holding because if the US ever goes to war with North Korea, that's the base. Um, and so what's interesting is, so my great grandmother was a subject of Japan, Spain, and the US all within her own lifetime without leaving this island. And um, it's kind of tagline or the way that it tags itself for tourism is where America's day begins because it's furthest back on the date line. Um, and it has the highest number of people joining the US military proportionally. So if you look at this chart, which is very small, there are more people joining the US military from Guam than Montana, Oklahoma, Hawaii, Alabama, but people in Guam cannot vote for president. So they pay taxes to the US, they have a US passport, but they can't vote for the person who would send them to war or the person who would set those taxes. Um, the other thing is spiritually, 
Um, we were, uh, before it was, um, I guess, Christianized uh, by the Spanish, uh, we were animists. And so we believed that when we die, um, our bodies and our spirits become part of banyan trees. So we are part of nature. We go back to nature and we look after those that come after us, which is very similar to certain Adivasi um, traditions um, or uh, also traditions from the Chittagong Hill Tracks. So I work a lot with indigenous communities, not because it's trendy, but that's because that's that's the plight of my people too. And um, it's, uh, so I love this work on the bottom right corner, which is by Joy Debrawaja, an artist from the Chittagong Hill Tracks uh, in Bangladesh, or this work on the left, which is by Art Labor um, and the Dry community from Vietnam. Um, and it's interesting in their, in their uh, reincarnation histories, you reincarnate through many, many layers until you become a drop of dew and you evaporate uh, into the universe. So I, I'm very interested in the connectivities of these kinds of um, struggles. And the other thing that primes how I understand Bangladesh is that um, part of the process of colonization was banning the local language. So Chamorro is the local language, it's almost dead. And that's because it was banned. Uh, the US banned it in school. They wanted to eradicate this culture. And, um, but that's what happened in Bangladesh too with the language movement. So this idea of a people mobilizing to want to protect their language and their culture was very close to home for me, as is the um, struggle um, of climate change. So the Pacific Islands and Bangladesh are at the forefront, they're ground zero for climate change because of rising sea levels. So my point to bring up this slide is that places can be extremely geographically disconnected, but the challenges can be similar. And um, you know, I never thought that my point of view in Bangladesh or in, in Guam would be priming how I would, uh, how I would approach challenges in Bangladesh, but the two are very much connected. Um, Okay, so my life from 2013, uh, well, earlier than that, I would argue, yeah, 2010 to, to until what, what date, March 6th, uh, 2020, was a time of just traveling everywhere all the time. And um, I found this uh, in my uh, notebook the other day. This is a, my proposed itinerary from November 2019 until September. Um, 2019. Um, so things changed, but this is how I thought I would spend the year. Um, and so I was seeing that I would have 97 days in the European continent. I literally would have to count where I would be, and it was crazy. But the reason for this is that the world really didn't know very much about Bangladesh. Like um, there was this incredible concert, something I'm working on right now, that a concert for Bangladesh in 1971 that George Harrison and Ravi Shankar organized in Madison Square Garden. Um, and this happened August. Bangladesh wasn't an independent country until the end of December. So imagine this is over six months before India stepped in to help the war um, end. But the first time the world had Bangladesh on its lips was through a song that George Harrison wrote. And the cover of the album was a starving Bangladeshi child. So most of the time, if I would talk to people outside of South Asia, or actually even in India about Bangladesh, the only thing people would want to talk to me about was poverty. But Bangladesh has such a wealth of cultural history of cultural histories and when you see images like that you can't fathom that the sounds coming from those lands were not always ones of suffering like Bengal was one of the most wealthy civilizations of all time so how to recalibrate how the world considered Bangladesh and also how Bangladesh saw itself relative to the rest of the world so this kind of international travel was very much um, involved in trying to build these global links to help people reconsider how their histories might be connected to Bangladesh. Um, and as people who are familiar with this project um, would know, is we collaborate with institutions on six continents. There's projects from the summit traveling all the time, including now we have work opening up that we produce with the Brazilian artist opening in, um, Oh my gosh, Hanover next week. Um, so, you know, there's things popping up everywhere. Uh, even we have another work by a Pakistani artist produced for Bangladesh opening in Brussels next week. Um, works connected to Bangladesh are circulating and my circulating in the world. We're very much tied to that. Um, and some local artists were wondering why have so many foreign artists in Bangladesh? But that was because also these international artists could understand how Bangladesh connects to them 
and take those journeys elsewhere and carry Bangladeshi stories with them, but it also gave context for people outside of Bangladesh to understand where these connections might lie. And, the, and you know, we're all connected. Um, you know, it's, uh, I think we see that now more than ever, like this fear of a virus spreading. We, we actually see more of our common humanity than we did before. Um, so, when the Samnani Art Foundation started, Nadia and Rajiv were young collectors. They're still young collectors. Um, but they were, um, the 20, 2011, 2012 was when a lot of um, museums were trying to start the South Asia Acquisitions Councils. And the Samnanis realized that actually these museums didn't know anything about Bangladeshi art. No one really knew anything about Bangladeshi art, much less the art of Sri Lanka, Myanmar. So Myanmar, in our platform, like some people call it part of Southeast Asia, Harvard counts it as South Asia. You know, you can, again, these regions, what does that mean? They're, they're human defined. So we, because of the rivers and the political connection with the Rohingyas, it, it comes within our fold. But where to learn about art from Myanmar, Bhutan, uh, Nepal, Sri Lanka, Afghanistan. I mean, Pakistan had a platform in India, but there was wasn't really a place to see art from this region under one roof or for these cultures that were very connected to come together in one place. And um, in 2012, when the Samnani started it, I mean, we'll go through it, but it started very much as a Bangladesh platform with some Indian guests and some international guests that came in. But when I came into the project, they really wanted to expand it to be a South Asia wide platform. And um, what was interesting was at the time, you didn't, it was, you know, Pakistanis could come to Bangladesh. It was very easy. Actually, anyone from South Asia could come to Bangladesh. That changed after the 2014 edition, but it was a place that where the region could meet in a way that India was not possible because of the India-Pakistan um, tensions. The region has become much more fractured since this started. So we also realized the importance of maintaining this kind of regional base, but we also realized that just looking at South Asia in itself wasn't enough um, to understand the complexity of a place like Bangladesh. Um, I love this image here where you see like kind of the, the Himalayas linking uh, this, this wide region. And I'll talk about geology in a bit, but um, it's, it's interesting when you also start thinking about how land masses were created by moving plates, uh, earth's plates that are still moving. Um, so because I had been living in India uh, from 20, so I, I started working on the, um, on the summit for 2014 and late 2012, early 2013, I'd been living in India. So that was my point of reference. I hadn't been to Bangladesh before. I hadn't, I, I think I'd met Mabu Ben Lippi from the Brito Arts Trust in London. But other than that, I really had no knowledge about Bangladeshi art and my, um, you know, it was a neighbor, but I'd never, you know, I knew, I knew nothing. And so it was, so I think that my program in 2014 was very India heavy, but it tried to look at how do countries in South Asia uh, connect to Bangladesh. So inviting artists to connect with that history and where these histories colli uh, collide. And the other thing was that, um, what is a summit? Like, you know, at first I thought that I didn't like that word, but now I really like it because you can change, a summit can be anything. You can change the meaning of it. Um, so I was also trying, because the Samdanis, what they were doing was so outside of any um, any box, right? They weren't doing this to build their collection. Like the summit, the, the commissions are separate from the collection. Um, it, it was, um, I wanted to kind of highlight the foundation as a platform that um, enables new work and new research. So you could see that with the early commissions. So this was an amazing piece by Shilpa Gupta. I'm sure many of you have seen this because it's shown in India, it's shown in Venice, it's kind of been all over the world that we helped catalyze and fund her initial research in the uh, Chitmahal, um, which interestingly, uh, this, this problem is almost done now since there was an exchange of land, but these pockets of Bangladesh in India and these pockets of India within Bangladesh. So you can be in a place where maybe marijuana is growing legally, but a child can't go to school because they don't have an identity card. So the mother will have to fake that the father is someone from outside that has an identity card in order for the child to be seen by the state. Um, so it was this really interesting place of these bleeds between countries, these glitches between um, arbitrary uh, political um, uh, political exchanges of land, the stories behind those. Um, and so, yeah, this was a very political project to show in a government building because our building is a government building. But what's incredible with our collabor, you know, the, the government gives us this building for free and um, we have been able to have a, a place to be very critical of, um, of uh, recent political um, 
histories. So this, this was great. And what, was, what I also realized through this project is while in Bangladesh, we were able to, and again, at this point, the summit was three days, we could have live performances the whole time because of the duration of the show. But when this traveled to Berlin for the Berlin Biennial, for example, the performance could only happen at particular times. So audiences weren't experiencing the work in the way that perhaps we wanted it to be staged because it was limited by budgetary restrictions. We of course also have budgetary restrictions, but the length of our show, we try to make it in a way that everyone can experience everything. Um, next, uh, this was a work by a Tibetan diaspora Nepalese artist who now lives in Oakland. His name is Sharon Sherpa. But you know, when I was talking to him about Bangladesh. He was so moved um, because um, his religious practice is um, informed by the teachings of Atisha who came from Bangladesh. So um, he made this uh, beautiful installation um, that was inspired by Atisha and this movement and displacement of people that, that carries with you spiritually as you move across the world. Um, and that was also really interesting when thinking about Bangladesh. Um, you know, while it is a Muslim majority country, um, uh, Religious parties are illegal. It's a secular country. So it is not the Islamic Republic of Bangladesh. It's the People's Republic of Bangladesh. And um, the country has an incredible and longstanding Buddhist history, um, which is also interesting to look at. Um, and, and you can see it in some archeological sites and in, in um, different strands of culture and stories and histories. So this is something that Cora Crate and other artists have responded to as well. Um, See next. Okay, this was also kind of a turning point both for the artist and for us. Um, so Rana Begum was born in Bangladesh, but she left when she was very young. I believe she was six. And she um, went to school in London. Her teachers were British. She has a studio in London. Um, but we um, had her first kind of major showing in Bangladesh in 2014. And we have 120% um, taxes on foreign art in Bangladesh, um, we don't have proper art handlers. And imagine this is 2014 before we had really built any of the infrastructure that we have now. Um, the kind of work that she's known for is not really something we could show in Bangladesh. So we worked together and she remembered that she had these childhood memories of weaving baskets in Silet. And um, she made this beautiful installation that was um, Ref referencing kind of this feeling of exhilaration and calm that she remembers from being in mosques and with the shifting light inside. Um, and so we commissioned this piece with her made out of hand woven baskets. And for those of you who are familiar with her work, it really is about light. So in the way when you moved, when you, when you remove these heavy um, aluminum panels and other um, industrial materials and you distilled it into moving light, you could read the other work in an interesting way. And it was, I think, a turning point in her practice, but also in the reading of her practice. And it was interesting that British curators who were visiting Dhaka Art Summit, who never visited Rana in London, um, started giving her opportunities as a Bangladeshi artist in the UK. Um, so now, like one of our challenges as Rana is a close friend is, you know, that this, this piece is referenced a bit too much. Her work is not just about light in a mosque. So it's how to recontextualize, how to look at the wider picture. But this was interesting when we saw that the summit could be a platform to reconsider an artist's practice from another light, but also that you know, this piece is not possible to produce in the UK. The economics of this are impossible to produce anywhere outside of Bangladesh. For us, like paying people fairly is very important. So this piece has been produced multiple times, like for, um, you know, we make sure that the basket weavers are, are paid a fair wage, but you know, we've, we have become the kind of Bangladesh production house for Rana as this piece travels. And it creates opportunities for um, local makers in Bangladesh, but also for international audiences to experience this work. Um, so in the 2014 summits, I'm also a very self-critical person. So I'm also really interested for the questions at the end of this talk, but um, someone in a talk, um, it was a um, Belgian, um, I think she was Belgian, yeah. a Belgian person living in Sri Lanka who was an artist who said, you know, this is great that you're having, you know, artists like Rana, who grew up in the UK showing in Bangladesh, but like I grew up in Sri Lanka and because I'm white, I'm never going to be included in one of these, uh, you know, South Asia shows. And I actually thought that was quite an interesting point um, because there, um, Shane Javeri wrote this book that I love called Western Artists in India, but there are a lot of artists um, of different um, ethnic backgrounds and cultural backgrounds whose lives and practices were very moved by the time they spent in South Asia, or other people who might have been born in South Asia whose work 
carries that kind of um, history or that point of contact. And South Asia has long been a point of international contact. So I thought about that and the 2016 summit transition to try to look at these transnational connections between Bangladesh and the rest of the world while still maintaining its South Asia focus. Um, so for example, we did the first major South Asia showing of Linda Benglis. So she created new works for this. Linda, um, her partner, uh, was Indian. She still has a studio in Ahmedabad and um, you know her video for R21 was shot in Ahmedabad and she talks about the influence of the colors and the forms of textiles and how those impacted her work. Um, and when I visited her in uh, Santa Fe in her studio there, it was great. She was playing Indian ragas in her truck, putting masala in her omelets, like, you know, and, and we were just talking about how much India impacted the way we see and feel the world. So this was very, um, was quite a uh, a moving experience to show someone like that in South Asia to huge audiences. Here I write Tino Segal because I can't show pictures of his work, but um, Tino Segal's uh, father, um, I guess it's now Pakistan, but is Indian, was Indian, Pakistani, I mean, those lines shift. But um, also that I, um, there are ideas from South Asian spirituality that pop up in his work. And um, we showed this, this beautiful work um, from his Anne Lee or Philippe Perino's wider Anne Lee project um, of a little girl who was an anime character freed from the game who um, is asking these very existential questions, like would you rather be too busy or not busy enough, which is a great question for COVID times. But, um, but also that idea of what does it mean to become an individual with agency? And societies in South Asia are changing very quickly, especially with, young, um, with, with the young generation where people are starting to break out of that multi-generation household structure. So I thought this was interesting to show at the time. Um, the image on the bottom left is from an exhibition that Nada Raza curated um, called The Missing One, looking at histories of science fiction and, and contemporary art in the region. But it's by an older generation Belgian artist, different one from the one I mentioned from the top, named Saskia Pintalan, um, who still works and, li and lives in Sri Lanka. Um, and then on the right, this was our first kind of modern art show called Rewind um, that I worked on with Amara Antilla, Beth Citron, and Sabi Ahmed. And what's also interesting here is all these names of guest curators that I'm mentioning, we're all around the same generation. So it was also um, a move that we, we didn't want to work with kind of the, I mean, we do work with them obviously, but like we wanted to be a platform to launch opportunities for a new generation of curators rather than working with um, so you know at that point all of these people I mentioned we were all like assistant curators but to give people a chance to do something without being someone else's assistant with their own name on something and a fresh generational take um, on what was happening in the region so back to the show like um, this artist on the left um, who was seminal to the history of printmaking in Bangladesh, Shafuddin Ahmed, uh, he studied in London and his time in London was very formative to his works or the works you see in the back by Nalini Malani, those were made when she was in Paris. So South Asian artists also, their experiences abroad shaped their the future practices as well. Um, but in the 2016 summit, so I started with all these transnational practices because I had been working in Bangladesh for, you know, two years at that point, three years at that point, um, was really when I started working on ambitious new commissions with emerging Bangladeshi artists. When I came into the project, I didn't have the time or relationships to be able to do that. And I had to pull off the show very quickly. But it was when the summit started to transition to really becoming like, you know, the Bangladeshi artists became the heart and the center and the, um, the carrier of what made the project so, or what makes the project so successful. Um, so we commissioned a work by Shumon Ahmed here, where he was looking at a Bangladeshi detainee in Guantanamo and um, using a VR technology threw us into this space of trauma. Like how do you shake someone out of their head? So there's all these torture techniques of using, um, you know, flashing lights, heavy metal music, sensory overload. Um, so I thought this was a very interesting project. And again, like to the point of political criticality, we can have a DAS, the American ambassador experienced and participated in this work. Um, and it was, uh, it's great to have an open place for such wide groups of people to be able to discuss these issues. Um, to the, the top image on the right is a solo project by Aisha Sultana. Um, and again, Aisha, I mean, many of you are probably familiar with her work, but it was, um, you know, she doesn't have space in Dhaka to make these kinds of environments. Um, and so it's great to also give artists whose most of their opportunities are showing abroad homegrown um, spaces and also ways where the space can be 
part of the artwork. So at this point, we were building spaces to house works, which we'll get into how we shifted away from that later. Um, at the bottom is a, a moving work by Munim Wasif called The Land of the Unidentified Territory, where he's looking at um, spaces between borders where people are cutting away at the landscape in order to build the roads and infrastructures uh, to gentrify the rest of the country. And I mean, it, it creates these kind of moving alien landscapes. And so this work has traveled to um, Guangzhou Biennial, Singapore Biennial, um, part, the photographic part of the work are now in Tate's collection. But again, what's great, these projects are all born in Dhaka with us. Um, this is another image of um, Rewind, that first show I, saw, I spoke about. So basically it was looking at the development of abstraction from figurative practices um, uh, in, in South Asia. And so um, here was the first time that we did that Rashid Chowdhury had a major international showing at the Dhaka Art Summit. So Rashid Chowdhury is an artist that's very moving to me. And if I were to talk about, was there an artist that to me describes what Bangladesh is, I would probably argue that it, it, for me, it's Rashid Chowdhury. So there are the images on the right, these beautiful um, kind of cubic, cubist inspired tapestries. So Rashid studied at La Col de Boza in uh, France. He met his French wife there and was moved by tapestries he was seeing in Europe, but also by the work of Marc Chagall. And um, he started creating these tapestries, which are from natural dyes grown locally in Bangladesh, locally woven, locally um, uh, produced with natural materials, but that weave together Buddhist, animist, uh, and Muslim um, folk culture into one plane. And um, I think that is what's really beautiful about Bangladesh is that all these culture, or all of these diverse systems of belief um, found in villages form a unified culture and that they can come together or be woven together in something harmonic. So the works are very beautiful, but they're also political. And um, what was great is that images from these, uh, so Rashid Chowdhury is now in Tate's collection. He's now in the Mets collection. There's, there's a lot of interest in him and also some of these works from Monica Correa made around the same time um, are in MoMA's collection. But how through research, we can help fill gaps and holes in, um, in a Western canon, um, in a small way. But what's also important is that we don't want all these works to leave the region. So also for us, like, you know, making sure that we have, we meaning the Samdani collection have a strong holding of this artist's work um, and that we, we do research on the artist's work, it's important. So it, it's a balance between giving this international visibility, but making sure that works stay home for local audiences to see and to reconsider. And what I should also say is that, you know, Rashid Chowdhury, is, is not the poster child for Bangladeshi modern art. It's Zainal Abedin, it's other artists. So at this point, like Rashid Chowdhury was, I would argue, underappreciated and underrepresented and, and the summit played a role in catalyzing much more research and, and um, opportunities to look into this really unique and diverse history. Um, research I mentioned is really important to what we're doing. So we call ourselves a research platform equally to being an exhibition platform. So this image here was a real turning point for me. Um, so after the, um, after the 2014 DACA Art Summit, uh, and I mentioned this thing about practicing, um, I felt this huge void, like um, almost like this existential void where, you know, the summit's over, what am I doing? And it was really depressing actually. So I decided after the 2016 summit, and maybe this wasn't a good idea, but I was not gonna let myself get depressed. So I flew two days later to Japan for a two month research fellowship in Fukuoka. And um, I actually got the research fellowship to study a Bangladeshi modern artist named Esim Sultan, who was said to have had a solo show in Fukuoka in 1980. He actually didn't, that was published misinformation, which I figured out while going through the archives. But what I did find in these archives was this incredible image of this very dapper man on the left with sunglasses on, who was bell-bottom suit, probably around my age at the time, who um, was in Fukuoka in 1980. And you see this tapestry behind him, very similar to this one. Um, and um, this man on a panel, so his name is Syed Jehangir. He sadly um, left this world last year, a big loss for Bangladesh, big loss for me. But um, you know, in 2014, in a panel at the summit, he was saying, why do we have a summit? Like we have the Asian art biennial. And he was very dismissive and a bit like cocky and um, you know, wasn't such a fan. And I realized why after I saw this picture, because this man uh, in 1980, so imagine Bangladesh isn't even 10 years old, 
um, started something called the Asian Art Biennale in Dhaka, which is the first, the oldest continuously existing Biennale in Asia. It still exists. I, I don't think it's so relevant anymore for because it's mostly a government thing. It's not really a curatorial platform. But when Syed Jahangir did this, he was a consultant um, as Fukuoka was trying to become a locus point for Asian art. And um, he traveled to Japan many times with some whiskey and some small catalogs where he was showing the art of Bangladesh. And he wanted to make this biennial and he convinced the art. So while government said no, that when he, when they officially approached governments and they said no, the leading artists of these countries came together and organized their own country's participation. So some of the leading Southeast Asian artists were exhibiting in Bangladesh in 1981. And some of the works from the, Bang, uh, from the Fukuoka Asian Art Show, which happened in 1980, were the same works that ended up in Bangladesh in um, that first uh, Asian art channel. And the first, you know, when Saeed Jahangir was there, so in the 80s to the early 90s, it was really a phenomenal um, platform in terms of the minds and people and connections that came together. Um, and my assistant curator, Ruxmini, um, and that's another really important part of this project, is working with talented and passionate Bangladeshi young professionals. I don't speak Bangla. So while I can come with ideas and, and reference points, like it, it's them, it's their story to tell. So she was going into the, um, the national collection, finding the works that had been exhibited and collected because the, the government was collecting out of these Asian art biennales. And we were able to tell a story through an exhibition of how Bangladesh wanted to present itself to the world through this collection it built but also international artists and governments donated works to Bangladesh. So the Philippine Pavilion from the 1983 um, edition was donated to the National Collection. We were able to show some of those works that people didn't know about. Um, so around this point, there was a lot of interest in learning more about Bangladeshi art. So um, I curated a show in Vienna that had, uh, I think, 13 emerging Bangladeshi artists. Um, which was quite fun. Some of those artists became signed by Krinzinger Gallery and it opened up new opportunities for them. Um, and this was another point where my world shifted. So I was um, given a opportunity I couldn't refuse and it was a wonderful and life-changing experience to um, become the founding artistic director of a project um, called Bellias Artist Projects, which still exists um, just under different leadership in the Philippines to develop a uh, residency and exhibition program in a collection of historical fa Spanish Filipino houses. Um, and so I was commuting between the Philippines and Dhaka which is crazy because those countries are really not connected, um, really difficult flights, uh, often the only woman on the flight because it was mostly migrant workers. Um, but it, it changed the way I saw the links between South and Southeast Asia because I was one of the few people traveling between these two, but seeing, or uh, from the art community, but seeing the intense links between them. So this was an image of, so right after the DAS 28, edition. Yeah, I curated this show. I mean, I worked on it before, but it opened right after um, of one of my favorite artists, American artist, Bruce Connor. Um, so this was in um, a church that you don't know whether the church is has been bombed out or if it's coming up, but um, we were so you can see the scale of this. It's huge. Um, but this is a, a work called Crossroads, which is made from uh, the declassified footage of Operation Crossroads of American uh, nuclear testing in Bikini Atoll. Um, and to show this on a site where there's a nuclear power plant and it's a World War II site was really quite a moving um, experience. But anyway, this time in the Philippines and also um, dealing with different scales, dealing with collections of architecture, building a library, being in a space that was open every day because we had, um, you know, the, the, our exhibition space was something that we had to, pro it was different from working on an event. It was something where, how do you draw people back to an exhibition over a three or four month run? It was a very different skill set, but one that was very useful for me. Um, but in this process of traveling, I understood that actually, and also my frustration with flight paths, it was really hell. Um, I realized that actually um, 
Dhaka is more connected to Southeast Asia and to the Gulf than it is to South Asia. So if you look at the national airline, which is Biman, um, the only place it flew to directly at that time was Kathmandu and Kolkata. It didn't fly to Bombay and it didn't fly to Delhi. And at this point, I was going to India so much less because the, there was only one direct flight from Bombay to Dhaka, which was jet. And the cost of that flight between, yeah, 2016, 2018, 2019 was more than a cost from Dhaka to London or Paris. Uh, it was really crazy. And I just started to see how fractured travel between the region was to get between, I think there were two flights a day between Yangon and Dhaka, Bangkok, flights super cheap, super easy, like the circulation of people within outside of South Asia, for, for Bangladeshis was much easier outside of South Asia. And also at this point, there was kind of a rising anti-Muslim sentiment in India. So we had issues with artists that would land in Bombay and the guest house wouldn't let them check in. Um, it was really this kind of eye-opening experience that we needed to look at um, Bangladesh's connectivity in a different way. So this is when Southeast Asia really started to come into the platform, which you saw in DAS. Uh, 2018 uh, and growing into 2020 and onward. Um, so I tried to kind of change the bearing. So I love the word bearing point, which is like we point on a compass. So that's, you know, the north, northeast, northwest. But how could we look at conceptual bearing points to help people reconsider Bangladesh, how they think about Bangladesh and its place in the world? Um, so these are some images, um, this piece with the um, clothing, which you'll see later, it's actually kind of stitched like a kata, um, like a kata quilt. Um, it's made of clothes of um, Bangladeshis who were trafficked out of the south of Bangladesh and sent to Malaysia as migrant workers against their will or tricked into signing these agreements. You know, there, there is modern day indentured uh, servantry slash slavery and Bangladeshis are very much a part of that. But also on the other side, clothes of Rohingyas as they shed them and get new clothes as they enter Bangladesh. Um, so this work I can talk about a bit more later. Um, this was paired by a work uh, with a Thai artist named Jakai Siributir, who took debris from both sides of the river where Rohingyas were crossing in um, Thailand and created these flags of invented countries that you had to navigate through. Uh, on the right, I love this, I love this artist, I love this work, Amin Tasha, who um, is an emerging artist from the Hazara community in Afghanistan, um, who actually had to flee after, when he was 18, after the Taliban saw a work he produced out of a workshop for Documenta 13. And this guy is amazing. He, he basically taught himself enough English to trick the border authorities. He got, in, he got himself a, he had to go into hiding, got himself a scholarship in Indonesia, was able to convince with the little English he taught himself um, that he was an artist on a scholarship. He now speaks fluent Indonesia, thriving in Yogyakarta. But this was um, one of his first big international showings. The work was acquired by a collection in Italy and this guy is, is thriving. Um, and, but back to the story of the work, the work is looking at the movements of Buddhism across the Silk Road. Um, and also the violence along the way and the kind of erasure of that history. But anyway, this, so this show was trying again to look at these connections that um, maybe regional politics today don't address. Um, let's see what else. Okay, so um, this was also interesting. Um, also, I guess moving for me, migrant labor. So that's something, you know, people talk a lot about Bangladeshi migrant labor in the Gulf. They don't talk about it so much in Southeast Asia. So this was a work by Charles Lim, who was looking at uh, the, the image on the left of Bangladeshi workers who are literally working underground, um, extracting material um, in Singapore. And um, I worked with a group of Bengali uh, migrant poets. This was amazing to work with these guys. So. Um, they actually presented in the Dhaka Art Summit, they presented their poems because they happened to be home visiting their families. The economists wrote about them. So these guys literally worked as construction workers during the day and on Sunday have um, a poetry jam session. And they publish their poems, which is also very brave because it's critical of the kind of uh, lifestyles that they're leading. But in the summit, we were able to give them center stage. So like the director of the National Gallery of Singapore was there as a visitor, but these guys were the speakers. And that's what's really um, rewarding is to be able to give platforms for talented people, regardless of their economic background, we can all be creative and life puts up barriers to tell us to stop. But I really appreciate people that continue on. Um, here, Hotsu Nayen, a very um, well-known Singaporean artist, um, but who's looking at where tigers, um, so the, you know, these tigers that become humans and morph back into tigers, but this exists in Bengali mythology as well. Um, 
we commission, so again, commissioning externally curated shows, very important because I don't wanna be the voice of South Asia. I don't wanna be, you know, I have a, we're all biased. I have a particular view. Let's widen it out and, and see how other people react to Bangladesh and how they read these connections. So Cosman Costinas curated a show, A Beast, A God, and A Lion, and this traveled to Warsaw, to Yangon, to Norway. It's going to, to Parasite in Hong Kong. It's traveling to Thailand. Um, I don't know when this show will end, but the point is it's looking at languages change, religions change, politics change, but weaving patterns change far more slowly. And how do we look at these movements of ideologies across Oceania, um, the Pacific, South and Southeast Asia? Um, Commissions, how am I doing on time, Falguni? We've crossed more than 50 minutes, so okay. we can wrap it up as fast okay. as we can. Cool. Um, so uh, commissions, so why would someone travel to Bangladesh to see something they saw somewhere else? So for us, having things be born in Bangladesh is very important and born at a scale that you wouldn't expect. So we don't want people coming in and assuming that it's Bangladesh and we're, you, you can't do this. We really try to <laughs> exceed what people can do, which I have to thank Nadia and Rajiv for bearing with that because it's, it's uh, nerve wracking. But um, this is a commission by Ritu Satar, which we co-commissioned with the Liverpool Biennial. So which was, what was great is that we can produce the performance in Dhaka, they cannot because of budgetary restrictions. They have funds to produce a film, which we cannot do to budgetary um, restriction. So by coming together, we produced this moving installation of droning harmoniums speaking out against rising fundamentalism in the region that became a film that showed in Liverpool, that also traveled to the Rotterdam International Film Festival, and that this now will be a solo presentation at MoMA. It, because of the pandemic, it was um, delayed, but it will be shown as a performance and an installation. And never in our wildest dreams did we think that a, an artist in their 30s that's never sold an artwork and doesn't have a gallery would have this kind of platform. But that's what we can do um, through collaboration and pushing artists to, to their highest potential. Um, the summit also became a more scholarly platform because I realized that there were huge holes in, uh, you know, art history doesn't exist in a vacuum. Um, so we had to kind of bring in the intellectual framework to help people understand uh, the present based on the past, the past based on the present, like that quote I opened up with. So we've had people like Gita Kapoor presenting, Gayatri Spivak presenting, um, and we began this Scholars Weekend and Critical Writing Program. Um, so we brought together indigenous writers and curators from all over the world um, to meet in Bangladesh of all places. And again, for me, it was important that they met in Bangladesh because Bangladesh is the land of people who speak Bangla, but there's at least 42 other languages. So how do we play with this from, uh, constructively play with this from Bangladesh. Um, and this Scholars Weekend um, was training to get a major grant from the Getty to create a larger academic program called our um, Mahasa program, Modern Art Histories in and Across Africa and Southeast Asia. So we went from kind of academics, still strong, but light in 2018 to something major in 2020. We have 21 emerging scholars from Africa, South and Southeast Asia. So you see our team here, like such a beautiful, diverse, young team coming together to look at shared art histories that do not find their center in Paris, New York, or London. And here we are in, in Hong Kong. So our last participant from Zambia arrived on the last flight before the airport shut with the protests. And we had two weeks of considering these art histories together in Hong Kong with the leading faculty led by Iftikhar Dadi. He did an amazing job um, that continued into Bangladesh. Um, so it was like kind of a year long and actually we have a, an active WhatsApp group that's still running, think tank of how to think of connectivity and shared histories outside of um, perceived centers. Um, this was a show I curated in Dubai. Some of the work, I'll, I'll go quickly, but some of the works here that you see, you would have seen in other slides that I showed, but it was a show uh, opened called Fabricated Fractures. Also looking at, you know, these fractured ways that we view the region that were fabricated by external forces, such as colonial forces or religious extremists to consider how we, we view um, South Asia. So it was a way that we brought together works from all the summits and from the Samdani collection to tell this ongoing story, which is where I realized, I mean, I'd realized it earlier, but a way where I could really articulate that the summits are not individual editions. It's one big growing project. So it's always training for the next thing. I do not see them as separate editions and this kind of narration, you see how they bleed into each other. Um, so this was great to see. So this work by Kamruzaman Shadin, which he extended to be the height of the building. So again, this is from DAS 20, um, 
2018, a work, a performance work by Aisha Jatoy from DAS 2018. Um, here with a performance piece of Ritu's that was altered, um, works by um, Hitman Gurung from um, Nepal, Ashfika Rahman from Bangladesh. And this is a very big, cold Rem Cool House building. And if we're talking about locally rooted practices, this is not a space I could do that. So with exhibition design and a lot of arguing and trust of the institution, we were able to add a mud floor into the space to actually kind of bring back, to ground this space also in the histories of the South Asian workers who built this place. Um, Here's Jackai's work that you saw earlier, Shilpa Gupta's work from the 2014 summit, Munim Wasif, so these were the works uh, that accompanied the video I showed from 2016. It was a way to bring everything together. And at that time, I was working on DAS 2020. I mentioned geology to you guys earlier, something I'm very interested in. Um, so, you know, 350 million years ago, you could walk from Australia to India and to Africa, right? So if we're thinking about the land masses that we see now, they moved. Um, and there's also a theory that they're continuing to move. So maybe Pangea Ultima, so like 250 million years from now, maybe the world will look differently. So why are we looking at these geographic regions in this way? So the word seismic movements was a way to kind of blow the region, you know, keep the regional, but blow it out of its box. Um, so we entered the show through this work by the Argentine artist Adrian Vijar Rojas and actually it was so interesting to spend time with him in Bangladesh and to see all the parallels he was drawing between South America and South Asia. There are huge parallels, but because of the language and the distance and the fact that there's no soft power body funding this, those lines aren't crossing. So that's something intellectually I've been working on a lot recently because I have the language skills to be able to draw those connections. But um, these fossils on the floor um, are basically 400 million years old. They predate Pangaea. So they're from a time when the world was one super ocean. And um, they're found, these, they're, they're shaligrams, right? So you can find them in the Himalayas, you can find them in Morocco, you can find them in the United States. They speak to a time of connectivity that we can't fathom now. And here, when you look at these fossil traces, right, this is what's powering our, our life now, our pre-pandemic, right, fossil fuels. We're burning layers of extinction to, to fuel a future. So anyway, this work, New Mutants, was kind of this way to consider all of this past, present, future in, in a very alien kind of landscape, which is the layers, layers of death that our life is built on. Um, this I was also, so when I thought about the title Seismic Movements, it was the connection of thinking between these two works. Uh, two works, meaning also this work on the left, which is a research project by an Algerian French um, art historian named Dr. Zahia Romani. So the piece was called The Seismography of Struggles, which looks at protest journals from the time of the Haitian Revolution until 1989, but from non-European contexts. So how could a slave rebellion in Haiti be connected to a farmer's rebellion in Bengal at the same time? These people never met, but their energy and um, desire to change the world was of a similar magnitude. So this was the first time I saw seismography um, added to a human context. So that's why I really loved this title because uh, a seismic movement could be an earthquake, it could be Pangaea, it could be earth plate shifting, but it could be a revolution. It could be a feminist movement. It could be, I mean, there's so many ways to read how a movement could be seismic. Um, I also love the pairing here with a Pakistani emerging artist named Madiha Sikander. So this is a curtain that's woven of beads and cloves, but with um, an indigenous community from uh, Canada. And so Madiha and this community were trading stories about their colonial histories, uh, histories of exchange. Think about like how much land has been traded for beads or what people have traded for spices. Um, and also the labor that goes into making art like miniature painting. Um, this was probably our most complicated work to install due to COVID because the flights from Canada to Bangladesh uh, were all flying through China and the artist had a Pakistani passport. So it was kind of amazing in terms of the seismic movement of friendship. Her boyfriend who had a Canadian passport flew, because this work can't ship because of the clothes, because it goes under some kind of food clause. It had to be hand carried. Um, so the boyfriend flew like a ridiculous flight because it then had to go via Korea to bring the work, install it like the night, two nights before, left. And then um, Madiha finally, like the government helped us get her a visa, came to deinstall the work also through Korea with crazy uh, layovers. But um, this was kind of our, we're very happy to have it, but I, I bring this up because it's friendships that make the summit happen. It's not, it's nothing else. 
Um, other seismic movements, I'm almost done, Falguni. Um, so here I loved, um, these are images of protest movements in 71 by the photojournalist Rashid Talukder that are overlaid with a video by the Brazilian artist Jonathan de Andrade. Uh, and here it's um, kind of a fantastical imagined, um, but also tied with, his, with real footage from an earthquake in Chile of what if the political debates of borders between uh, Peru, Chile, and Bolivia were fixed by an earthquake that would just like move that territory off into the Pacific. Um, but it was an interesting way to overplay these, um, you know, again, geological, uh, political movements, independence movements. So these movements, uh, I think some people misread them as being in particular spaces. They were all bleeding into each other because it's rare that you can see one movement that's only held into one category. Um, Moon and Wasif, beautiful moving work about uh, Rohingya refugees and what do you hold on to when you have to leave everything. Uh, this I loved, um, you know, Nilama Sheikh and Yasmin Jahan Nupur in Nupur's performance looking at the history of tea. So we think tea as being a very polite object, but when we look at the role of opium trade and bringing tea to the world and how India and Bangladesh and Hong Kong are implicated into that, super interesting, especially today as Hong Kong's um, political um, status is changing. Um, Dalyal Mamun, uh, older generation, um, seminal artist of Bangladesh with an emerging artist from the Chittagong Hill Tracks, Hublai Shri Chaudhry. So we try to meld all these generations together. Uh, the Shumoy group, so these are paintings from the 80s, which Dalyal Mamun was very much a part of this um, movement. Shumoy means time, but um, they were, you know, in an era of martial law, they were trying to push back um, and through their art making, um, push back against dictatorship. Um, Famine. This was also incredible, like through Mahasa, to look at the cross sections between famine and art histories between Ethiopia, Vietnam, Bangladesh, India. So here we had original Zainal Abidin famine drawings with um, the Wound series from Shomnath Hor, um, Zainal Abidin images of the cyclone, and SM Sultan. So this is a seminal work. It's very dark, you can't really see it here. Um, this work was made in 1975, so that's on the back of the 1974 famine, which is underspoken about for political reasons. But imagine in a time of a famine, you see a farmer with muscles like Popeye with a plant growing in his hand. But this idea of like the bodies and the resilience of Bangladeshi people in the face of famine. Um, and we showed this with the work um, by a Vietnamese artist about uh, the famine in Vietnam, which was also tied to jute and cash crops. So it's interesting to link all these histories. Um, emerging artist Marzia Farhana, work about ecocide. Um, our Samdani Art Award winning artist Shoma Shurabi Janat. Very hard to see this, but she took this form of a spiral. You enter through one ear, you exit the other, and you're brought into this kind of internal world in your head about when man and nature were connected. Um, we had a show called The Collective Body, which was looking at um, art collectives and building institutions like across Africa, South Asia, South America, Oceania literally like all these contexts with the thesis being that maybe in a collective in Bangladesh has more to learn from a, a collective in Nigeria than they do from a collective in London that has Arts Council funding. How do you build things from the ground up? Um, Roots, so we had a show about the history of um, Bangladeshi art taught through legacies of educators to students, curated by an artist and an amazing educator, Bishwajit Goswami. Um, and I'll close with this. Um, so, you know, I've been talking about regions and um, place, but you know, right now I'm less and less interested in that. Could a region be about states of mind, states of existence, states of struggle rather than nation states? Uh, and how and where do the struggles of South Asia connect outside of what's obvious on a map? Um, so these are what I'm thinking about. And um, yeah, very happy to answer questions. Of course, I could not touch on everything of this multi-pronged chimera of a project, um, but very happy to answer questions. Thank you. Yes, we are also so happy, Diana, for that journey you took us on and how each edition of death sort of bled into the next one. And I'm sure there are so many questions, uh, I can already see them coming, that our viewers are waiting to glean from your talk, such as, you know, why call it a summit as opposed to a biennale or an art fair? And what does it mean to put it in a South Asian context for a curator who is not from the region and still so committed to building transnational solidarities as you are? And especially now, how do you see these uh, solidarities to continue in our post covid times. So I'm sure all of that is going to come up now and I'm just taking a quick look at our chat box here. 
And I want to start actually with a conversation that you and I first had when we met. And I don't know if you remember this because we were in the middle of kind of like a sculpture installation panic. And you said to me, you said, Palguni, it's like when you're young, you can be cute but when you get older, you have to be good. And I know that came from your training as a ballet dancer, but I remember it immediately stuck with me as something that could be true of curating or even life itself. So I'm very, uh, and you also begun your, your, your presentation with this image of the ballet dancer. So that's where I want to start. Your transition from ballet dancer into a curator. And the reason is that how, important is it for you to have these unrealized projects, these dreams and ambitions somewhere in the hinterland of your sensibilities and, you know, readapt them to something new and make a summit out of it. And so much of the tale that you just told us is a tale of perseverance, of reimagining things and adapting them to the Bangladeshi context and sort of building from the ground up. So can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. You know, it actually, you know, like the ballet thing when it didn't work out was really actually quite painful. So it was something that I didn't really think about. And it was only later when I realized, okay, this is where this is all coming from. Um, but I think it's more about doing things with intention. And um, so, and an intention that's not driven, like, you know, so I didn't move to India to become a curator. It was just something that kind of happened based on interests and passion. I mean, I was curating in New York before, but it wasn't like, it wasn't my mission to go make the biggest, you know, it happened because of, um, yeah, I guess passion, uh, integrity, and trying to do what you do well in the circumstances that you have. Um, and trying to push yourself you know, I think sometimes maybe I push myself too hard, but that idea of pushing yourself and others um, to create a form of excellence that other people can enjoy. That also comes from Bill Forsyth. He says, just think about all of us in the performing arts. Like we're working really, really hard to create something beautiful and meaningful for other people to enjoy. So I think, yeah, that's kind of how I, I think about things. Um, you know, sometimes I think now I don't think art is enough. I don't think the art world is enough. So I'm now trying to look at these spaces between humanitarian. So right now what I'm really interested in is like that cross section between art and life. So socially engaged practice, right? So how, like if we can't have hundreds of thousands of people coming to the summit, how do we take the summit into communities with hundreds of thousands of people that, that live their life? How do, you, how do you bleed those things together? So I think, I'm, yeah, that's, I'm interested in these bleeds across disciplines. So, you know, I, I mentioned I'm reading economy books right now. I'm reading design books right now. It's, um, you know, artistic thinking, which I would argue that Mohammed Yunus, that's artistic thinking. He took a $27 personal loan and, and turned it into something else. Again, microfinance has its issues. I'm not like trying to lotify this, but I'm just saying that it's a way of using creative thinking to build something in the world. And I think that other disciplines have so much to learn from art. Um, so I'm interested in looking at how those all come together. Yeah, on this note of using creative thinking to build, some, uh, build say in your case, an exhibition, because uh, that's what we do. These are the tools that we have and the circumstances that we have, like you said. So I want to take this conversation in a direction of say space and exhibition design. And mm. I know that you've spoken uh, so strongly in the past about not wanting to transform Shilpakala into like a Western white cube space and instead facilitate the works of artists which lend themselves to that space. I mean, even if I think about something like Adrienne Villa Rojas's work, which yeah. is fossils, so you imagine it would be in museum conditions, but for you to put that right at the entrance of Shilpakala, I mean, how, how, do you, how, how does your thinking around exhibition design uh, how, how do you see it changing in, in, in our world now? And I think I can just club that here with another question from Bhavik Shinde who asks, how to use architecture of the gallery to make the audience connect to the key theme of the exhibition? Great questions. And I have to say that like the first time that I had experience kind of dealing with a daunting scale of a space and a different kind of context without museum conditions was working with Vijay and Sunita Chararia on their mall in Chennai. Um, you know, how do, how do we take art and activate a space with so many people? That was really a founding 
uh, kind of experience that that helped with the summit. But um, I, how do I say this? Like, so when we first started the summit, I showed you pictures. We were building these white cube walls that would almost look like, you know, you were in a museum in Europe and people found that very impressive. Um, but then we would have to take down the walls rebuild the wall and I would take down the walls. And then I would see that other exhibitions in Bangladesh were then rebuilding the walls. And it's really bad for the environment. And often the build cost is more, more money than the cost we could give to the artwork. And I just found it a huge waste of potential. Um, and also artists in South Asia are not making work in museum conditions, right? Like we know how the electricity goes out all the time. We know about the humidity levels. We know about the floods. Like, works of contemporary art are not being made in those uh, conditions. So why should we be limiting uh, what can be shown or what we call as art to those conditions? Again, I am not going to risk artworks that need museum conditions by putting them in an open plaza, but um, maybe that's not the kind of art we should be showing. Maybe we should look like for areas that have existing air conditioners and put the works that need um, those kind of conditions in there and imagine an exhibition for the building rather than trying to change the building to be what we want for the exhibition. It was a huge mental shift um, because actually we were always looking about what the Shilpa Kala Academy didn't have, right? We would complain, oh, it doesn't have centralized AC. It doesn't have these big rooms, but actually it's really cool that it has this inside outside feel. What museums in, in New York and uh, you know, London don't have that. And artists really actually like these kinds of abilities. So here you see the inside and the outside were bleeding into each other. And we also wanted to make that point that art and life bleed into each other. And Adrian's work, those are fossils that have been, you know, they, they, they've lasted 400 million years. They can go outside. Of course, they're, because of all the people walking over them, they will need restoration. But those are works that can exist there. So we tried to curate for the building and with the building rather than against the building and that made a world of difference and also we had this think tank which we called um, a workshop for exhibition making and unmaking so every material we put in we had to think about where it would go when it came out we didn't want to have waste so when you saw that kind of show the collective body of these curving walls made out of jute so like here you're seeing this bamboo um, frames with a jute. That um, work on the outside is a large cinema banner painting. Um, it unrolls off of this rented metal scaffolding and it's going to travel to Berlin. And, and so basically the wall becomes an artwork that shows in a show later. So we tried to think about how to not put money into temporary infrastructure, but to put it into art making. Mm -hmm. Because we're talking about the inside and the outside of a space, I, I'm going to take one more question here from Bhavi sure. Shinde. He's, he's, because he's talking also about how diff of different things coming together. Mm -hmm. And he says, how to mix two different time spans and cultures in one composition to create a narrative story. And I'm also really interested because, I mean, we were just talking about Adrian's work. And if we think of another Brazilian artist that was in the DAS this year, Antonio Diaz, who worked mm -hmm. on the Nepal papers. Love and that. I think you also had Elena Demiani working again with Nepalese paper. Yeah. So, you know, you have these art artists from Brazil working on a work from Nepal. So you're really in the space of one exhibition holding together, like Bhavik says, different time spans and different cultures. So how do you do that? Uh, well, I wouldn't say it's just two time spans. I think it's a multitude of time spans. Yeah. <laughs> Geology is what's so cool to think about that, right? Because you can have one piece of rock and in that one piece of rock, the history of the planet, right? Um, I find that so interesting or like you can have like farmers in, uh, you know, a rice field that suddenly they're going to dig and like, you know, a, a Hindu sculpture will, will come up from a different period of time. So I actually think that we're, we're living on all these different periods of time. Um, and it's moving to see that and also to, um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm rambling here, but like, you know, Antonio Diaz, for me, that was so moving that an artist um, had his for a formative change in the way he worked by this time he spent in Nepal, where people in Nepal and South Asia don't know about that, but it was so formative to someone who is considered one of the most historically important Brazilian artists. So to try to bring these histories together in a place where everyone can learn from it um, is, is very meaningful. And also, um, I think when we bring together different time spans and cultures, we also realize how they impact each other and how they'll continue to impact uh, each other in the future.
Yeah, I have, because everyone is so interested in Adrian's work, a question <laughs> from Ileana Ramirez here, sure. who asks, can you tell me a bit more about his installation, the, black, the big black figures on the wall? Sure, so this piece is called New Mutants. So it's also, I mean, it's also interesting, I like, you know, how do we mutate in this uh, future world? So they, they could be aliens from the past. Like, you know, there's also the, I mean, there's many readings of this work, but, you know, kind of racist, um, views of um, racist views of um, non-Western cultures say that aliens came and built it, right? Because you can't possibly imagine that uh, non-white men could build uh, structures like that. But, you know, could they be aliens of the past that are looking on humanity now? Could they be aliens of the future? Um, yeah, so I think it's, um, so yeah, they were um, just these projections to move you um, out of time, but also Adrian is interested also in these um, histories of humans making marks on walls. So this floor installation, um, which is actually much bigger than that, um, debuted at the um, Oh my God, Kunst, uh, Kunsthaus Bregenz. And on the walls, he and a graffiti artist um, who was also in DACA with us and responsible um, for those, um, well, you know, she, he works with a lot of graffiti artists, but we had one with us in DACA who made those new mutants. Um, they were looking at the history of human mark making from the most ancient of cave paintings to political graffiti in Brazil now. How do humans make their mark over time? And like our time on this planet is so minuscule when you consider the marks of, of geology or the time that that states. And what you didn't see in these pictures is that the fossils were, were surrounded by rammed earth walls. So you almost feel like you're in a fossil dig, but those rammed earth walls had fireplaces and uh, burned out fireplaces. And fire was a seismic movement of when we learned to domesticate and stay still, right? That's when agriculture was being developed and when we became settlers rather than nomads. So there's many, again, many layers of that work. Yeah, I want, to, uh, I want to build a little bit on Bavik's question, actually, sure. because you said, you know, it's about holding these multitudes together. And as a curator, for you to not have kind of, a, uh, you know, like a curatorial premise for the, for, the, for the summit, but instead have this overarching umbrella theme within which, and I remember when I saw the desk this year, you had these specific rooms, which is, say, one is dedicated to geological movements, say the works of Clarissa Toussaint, or another room to queer and feminist emancipation with the works of, say, Chitra Ganesh, Bharti Kher, and a room for colonial movements with works of Shiraz Beju, uh, and the such. So how does it work, you know, if you have kind of this overarching umbrella and not a specific premise, which it, you know, it's, it's not top down then. Is, is that a conscious decision for you as a, as a maker of exhibitions? I would say yes. I mean, the thing is, I feel like, so, you know, like, so for example, that Barty Care work was outside and the feminist movements was inside. So these were not meant to be rooms that were only falling under that definition. I think that that was maybe part of the limit. Like, you know, it's hard with sign making to get all of these across. So I think some people maybe got lost that, you know, nothing really only fit in one movement. It was more of a way of organizing the different readings of seismic movements. So maybe I would have done that differently with the wayfinding, but um, I think, so the way that I, I tried to get to this in the talk, but the way I came to this theme was by just looking at different artworks at a time when there was protests all over the world, right? At a time when the world felt super fractured. So it was like by looking at artworks that I came to a theme, it wasn't that I had a theme in my head and then started cherry picking artworks. They're two very different ways of working. So what I'm enjoying right now is that, you know, as I have a clean slate to plan the future exhibitions, I'm just looking at work and the theme will emerge from whatever work I'm looking at. Um, looking at things with an open mind is like the the most freeing thing as opposed to having a deadline and being like, okay, I have a show on this date. I need to make something where, where you know, so it, it's a different way of working. Um, and I like people to kind of be able to have the openness to draw their own connections rather than me dictating or rather than having someone just have to live out what I see in my mind. I think maybe it's a way of giving agency to the audience. Let's that I, I mean, I like that we're on this note of planning for the future because we did have a question. Uh, I'm forgetting from who, just one sec. Uh, Arti Kirill Loska, who asked when was the next Bangladesh Art Summit? 
And just to add on to that, you know, uh, as someone who saw the summit in its planning and installation stages, and as opposed to the grand opening, and I know it was really grand, I, I saw how instrumental uh, Bengali is to your curatorial vision. And I read that in, in an interview of yours where you say that DAS will really come into its own the day it has a Bengali curator and who curates for a Bengali audience primarily in mind. And while that's a commendably self-aware statement for you to make, uh, I know you said you're deeply self-critical in your talk as well, but as a practitioner, when you're positing or putting forth your own redundancy, uh, how, how, how do you deal with that? Well, I think that, you know, institution building is part of my curatorial practice. And if this is a project that's meant to empower voices from Bangladesh, how wonderful would it be? Or, you know, I would have done that and I would have built that platform when it can be led by someone Bangladeshi. And I think that you can be a different person in a different language, right? The way that you formulate sentences, the way that you, um, yeah, there's certain words that are untranslatable. Like even it was such a rewarding experience coming up with a Bangla name for seismic movements. There is no literal translation of seismic movements in Bangla that allows for the multitude of readings. So we came up with the word Shoncharon, but it was with a group of, um, of Bangladeshi intellectuals. Um, and yeah, I think, um, you know, I, I think it's uh, the days of, you know, well, I've, I mean, I've been working in Bangladesh for such a long time. It really feels like home for me. It's something that will always prime the way I feel and see the world. But um, I think, yeah, that, you know, these days of calling in foreign curators to tell your story, like, you know, they, the local people need to tell their own story. So if I can help empower that by the experience and privileges that I've had, um, you know, I, I, I think it's great. Um, so, um, and life is about constantly learning. So our next summit is in 2023. Um, you know, I'm still working. I'm still the artistic director of the foundation. I'm still the chief curator of the summit. Let's see where it goes. But I think, you know, the more what I'm loving about the pandemic time is like my assistant curator, Ruxmini, and the Samnanis, they're doing Adas on Fridays in Bangla. I'm taking Bangla classes, but my Bangla isn't good enough to participate in these. But I think the more things that we do in Bangla, um, yeah, it's going to open up readings of things that I can't access. And I don't want to be the, the central point of knowledge. I really want to disperse it, step back and disperse it. So um, let's see, like when it's ready, that'll be great. But I think that's, that's the mission is to build a local infrastructure that can, that can lead itself in its own language. Yeah. I think it's like that thing you said in your presentation about the box step becoming kind of a circular step. So breaking structures while being in them. That's, that's the note we'll end on. And I'll ask Saloni to come in now for closing the word of thanks. Saloni, do you want to come in now? You're yeah. on mute. Thanks, sorry, I didn't realize that. <laughs> Thank you, Falguni, and thank you, Diana, for that wonderful conversation. I'm sure it's been a treat for all our viewers to get this insight into your curatorial vision and to see it unfold over many years, especially to see something this large, you know, um, has to be nurtured so small and how sowing every seed matters. So whether it was from building a collection for the Samdanis to incorporating Bangladeshi artists into the fold, which was not the case initially, to generating audiences from the subcontinent and all over the world, to pushing various new age as well as traditional local practices um, and putting Bangladesh on the world art map. It's been quite a journey. And thank you very much for that insight. As you said, we are all connected and I agree completely. And personally, I'm even more fascinated by your current research which is uh, drawing links between South Asia, Latin America, as well as Africa and its diaspora, which you do from your house in Brussels. So I would like to thank you very much for today. And uh, we will be taking a break, a short break for this series after concluding a successful run. And uh, we will be with you shortly, but do follow us on space118.com and our social media handles to hear of our upcoming speaker sessions. Thank you. Thank you, Palguni, and thank you, Diana. Bye. Thanks, Saloni. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.